Hey there, gang. How's your day going? This just happened to me. The bridge pin snapped right in half. Of course, this is 70-odd years old. Um, broke off in its hole, which is the first time that's happened to me, in my experience. So I guess I'm going to have to find uh, a replacement. Maybe I have something in the stash. We'll see. I'm going to be working on this SJ today, the 1951 example, the venerable multi-repaired uh, guitar here. Lots of interesting things in its history, I think. This little bit of um, repair work here around what I'm assuming was originally strumware. You can see in this area, on the outskirts of the pick guard. There's also, it seems, um, a piece has been inlaid because there's some mismatched grain in there. Don't quite know why, unless maybe they strummed all the way through. Or maybe um, there was a pick guard crack or something that got out of control, sort of on the margins of where the pick guard originally would have been. Sometimes the pick guard will shrink and crack the wood. Eh, we don't know. I think it's a reasonable repair, and it's sort of fun to speculate. Replacement nut there. Was at one point glued in, but which is no longer. Well, sometimes these things can be repaired. I've actually used this gel super glue on uh, ceramic coffee mug handles before, which have broken off while doing the dishes. And uh, they're still in use two and three years later, so it's a clean break. And uh, we'll see what this does. Let's have a look inside. Some revealing things are revealed. It seems that someone decided the braces could use scalloping after the fact. Now this was an operation you could get your neighborhood master luthier to do back in the day. Usually it was done to 1970s Martins though. This is pretty early for this kind of job. These braces originally were straight tapers and sort of triangular in section, only slightly heavier than the pre-war models. The amount taken off here is not completely unreasonable, but it's not difficult to seriously undermine the structural integrity by going too far. Maybe it did happen, because this also has an extra brace directly behind the bridge pad there, the slightly lighter colored one. This is sometimes a way to tame a bulge in back of the bridge. It flattens it out slightly. I think of it as Don Musser's little brace, because he started bracing guitars like this in the 1970s and found it produced a more even response and cut down on the soundboard deforming. Is that the original bridge pad? I think it might be. It's thicker than Martin's of this period, and it's in reasonable shape. The holes are doing well for themselves. It also shows evidence of a plug that's hidden under the bridge, kind of in the area where we often see an exit hole for an undersaddle pickup. But this guitar doesn't have a strap jack, so who knows what that's about. If we get in close, we can see some pretty careful splints under some major cracks. This is reasonable work, you know, and they seem to be doing their job. There's no reason to change this. So I had a look at all the major cracks, pushed and prodded with my thumbs to make sure that they were secure, because I am going to be clamping this into my neck removal jig, and the body of the guitar is going to be under a certain amount of pressure during that procedure. Um, this guitar, you'll remember, shows evidence of having its neck worked on previously. Here's another look at the marks on the heel. There are some cracks radiating up from the edges of the neck block. And, uh, of course, that compression checking, which suggests that the neck was under a significant amount of pressure uh, when they were trying to push it off. Um, enough that it squashed the wood. Despite this, though, the heel is pretty much level with the edge of the binding. And um, the action on this, although it's high, it isn't like super duper high. It's kind of within the range of normal high, you know. It's possible this neck was reset maybe 25 years ago. We don't know, of course. It's, it's almost like there should be a maintenance book that follows these things around, you know, just to get a picture of what they've been through over the years, and maybe notes for the next repair person. Um, this loss of finish on either side of the fingerboard extension could be pick wear, although it's kind of doubtful that you'd get your pick all the way up close to the edge of the fingerboard. Um, that may also be rub marks 
from someone trying to remove the fingerboard extension with their pallet knife. This whole idea of saving records for the next generation, I mean, it's, it could be used to make fun of people, but that's, you know, that's not what it's about. Because the whole business of removing necks is still a very, very young procedure, and it's constantly evolving. You know, we are one generation removed from a time when the way to do this job was to cut through the fingerboard at the body here, uh, which is of course the worst place to make that cut, by the way, you know, to pull the extension off. It'd be better off if you made it at, say, the 12th or 13th fret, so at least when you glue it back on, there's wood underneath the joint. But you can pull the extension off, revealing the dovetail, and then dribble some boiling water down in the space between the dovetail and the end of the neck pocket, or the mortise, and hopefully that will work. Um, the way I take necks off now is different from the way I was doing it five years ago, which was different from ten years ago, so it's still very much in development. Now, there is a potential complication which could explain why it was so difficult to remove the neck the last time. It's something that can really mess with the repair person. It's a nasty surprise from Gibson. And that is, at certain times, for some stupid reason, somebody at the factory thought that it would be a good idea to put the necks on the guitar before gluing on the soundboard, such that the top of the dovetail is buried under a layer of spruce like this. So, you can't really pull the neck off without... well, basically the entire guitar will self-destruct if you try it too hard. Uh, it happened for a couple of runs of guitars in the 1930s. I ran into one of those about 10 years ago. It was a Carson J. Robeson um, L00 style guitar made for Montgomery Ward by Gibson. But they also did it in the mid-40s to some southern jumbos. A viewer reached out to me to let me know that a 1946 SJ that he owns had a reset by Hoffman Guitars in Minneapolis years and years ago, and they ran into it. So what would you do in that case, where the dovetail is completely obscured? Uh, in the past, of course, we'd go back to cutting off the fingerboard extension, getting in there with a knife, and cutting some material away so that you have room for the dovetail to emerge. There are some magnificent thinkers in our luthier community who have devised less obviously destructive methods, such as reaching in to the sound hole with a knife, probably a scalpel blade, and slicing up through the soundboard along the front edge of the neck block in here. Counting on the fact that when you stress this and pull the neck up, the grain, which is weakest in this direction along its length, is going to split along a grain line up to the front edge of the neck block. Another thing that can be done, when we remove the fret to gain access to the neck pocket, nor ordinarily we drill a couple of holes and we insert either the steam needle or the heat probes, we could also cut down um, directly through the fingerboard and through the soundboard below. I've seen a pretty elegant way demonstrated by Ian Davlin, takes a single edge razor blade and I believe he's got stop holes on either side of the dovetail so that it's not going to split all the way off. But because the grain is running in this direction, it just pounds it right through the fingerboard and the spruce below, uh, you know, cleaving it, basically. And then again, relying on the fact that the wood is more likely to break along a grain line than across it. I guess it's probably a good idea to clamp down on either side of the fingerboard while you're trying to remove it so that you're not at the same time levering off the whole soundboard. Um, and that, you know, it's going to break again on the edges of the dovetail mortise and out it comes. In any case, it's messy, it's annoying, and it's really scary. And I still can't figure out how making the guitar in that fashion was somehow faster or easier. You know, this is not unlike that issue we discovered a few months back with the Thin Line ES guitar that had a tongue on the end of the neck that was glued under the back and at right angles to the dovetail, such that it had to be installed before the back was put on. Remember that one? Same Brainiac at work. 
So I have to loosen, or rather re-loosen the fingerboard extension here. I've got my sealing iron, which is just a small iron that's got a temperature rheostat controller on it. I want to run this uh, on the cooler side actually, uh, because this has got the perloid uh, inlays here which really don't appreciate very much heat. In fact the one up here seems quite degraded, it may have even been sanded through. I believe this thing has actually had a refret at some point. Um, so it's possible that someone leveled that portion of the board and got a little bit thin in terms of the uh, the plastic there. So, you know, I'm just going to let this go for as long as it takes to heat up. Even though it's chewed up at this point, I'm still going to do my best to protect the surface around the fingerboard extension with this thin sheet of plastic. People ask what it's for, and it's just to keep the edges of my knife which aren't in play from messing up the surface of the soundboard here, the lacquer. Because there's a certain amount of prying and going back and forth, and this it's maybe, you know, ten thousandths thick. It's not very thick. So, uh, you know, it doesn't interfere with getting the spatula under the board. And people ask about these. Um, these are simple artist's palette knives. They're available at any art supply store. I took the handles off and substituted tape so that they're a bit thinner and less likely to dig into the surface of the soundboard. So sometimes I think my videos suggest that this is a rather quick operation. It takes as long as it takes. And it can be, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour sometimes. Depends on the adhesive that was used, how much of it was used, and uh, other factors. But it kind of tells you when it's ready. Um, it's not usually easy. You've got to work the knife back and forth. I go from both sides inwards to the center. You know, I work from both sides going into the center, working it back and forth. Uh, you want to be careful, you know, you try not to come out through the other side because there's more chance of damage. And also you have to watch out if there are cracks, perhaps, on the underside, uh, through the soundboard in this area, which aren't uncommon. If the tip of your knife gets into one of those, it'll want to dive directly through the soundboard and come out on the inside of the guitar which is not the end of the world, you can still fix it, but we'd rather that not happen. So yeah, 20 minutes of sort of wiggling. While the frets are still warm, I'll take out the 15th fret here. I'm going to score along each side of it lightly with the tip of my scalpel blade. And again, this just creates a place where if chips want to form from the ends of the, uh, the barbs. Uh, they tend to break off at the line rather than going out into the board. Again, depends on the board. If it's really old and chippy, sometimes there's nothing you can do to stop it from splintering, but we do our best. I get my fret removal tool along one side, gently work up, take out that fret. I'm going to mark the base side of it so I know which is the base, because I'll be reinstalling this later. Might as well try and use the same holes again, although I would normally make them slightly, I think these are a little bit too far inward. I think uh, the dovetail usually stops about a quarter of an inch, maybe seven millimeters away from the edges. That's where I would normally drill, but in this case... I didn't drill in very deep. And of course you want to angle towards the center of the neck a little bit to follow the angle of the dovetail. Lot seems to have some glue in it. Now we really hope that the last person didn't put a bunch of glue all over the face of the heel or the sides. Uh, sometimes Gibson did that, but we want to hold ourselves to a higher standard. 
there's often going to be a little bit of filler along the sides of the heel. Sometimes it's glue. So I'm just going to cut through that with uh, the scalpel. Originally, and usually, Gibson would uh, assemble the guitar before spraying the finish on, so there's often quite a buildup of lacquer uh, right in the corner here, which you do need to cut through. Otherwise, um, well, it acts like a, an adhesive of its own, kind of, but uh, it could flake away in unpredictable ways if you don't at least give it a score line on which to separate. This uh, heel, of course, also has this partial crack. I could put some glue in that now. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, if it's going to break, it's going to break, even with the glue, because by the time we put enough heat into it, it will soften the glue in the heel. So, I think we're ready to put this thing in the jig. Where do I get the plan for the jig at? Uh, no, no. You either go to Stuart McDonald, the ones who make the commercially available one, and you purchase that yourself, or you be a big boy, and look at the pictures and draw your own concept of it. And by the time you've retro-engineered it, you might discover that the original isn't all that overpriced after all. Okay, so the heat source, again, are these foam cutters, available from Hotwire Foam Factory. Not a sponsor, but only because I don't let people sponsor me. They like me over there. These are a six inch model. They say six inches, but only about four and a half inches are the uh, are exposed uh, nickel chromium wire. There's this sleeve at the top which doesn't go in. Four and a half inches is deep enough to go into your deepest dreadnought. Um, if you were only going to do like classical guitars, which you wouldn't usually remove with this method, uh, you might get away with the four inch, but no, six inches is the way to go. Um, I just run them directly out of a six volt uh, wall wart adapter. You could buy ones with a rheostat to vary the temperature. I don't find it necessary. Because I only put them on for 10 or 12 minutes at a time, I'm not really at risk of burning out the wire or um, causing undue charring to the um, end of the dovetail. So, yeah, like I just put this on for about 10 minutes and I'll wiggle occasionally just to see what's going on. <clears throat> and then occasionally tighten up on the pressure screw on the bottom here. And after 10 or 12 minutes, usually something has happened. If something hasn't happened, oftentimes there's a problem, at which point I'll turn off um, the foam cutters and let them cool down a bit and investigate. These will last for like 10 different resets in this case, or more. Um, just got to be gentle with them. So I'll just turn those on and let that sit for about 10 minutes. A slight detour here as I'm reconfiguring some classical guitars from left-handed to right-handed use. This was made by local Hamilton builder Gerald Farrell. Not sure exactly when as the label isn't dated, but I think it was quite a while ago. Um, seems to be in the tradition of Herman Hauser. It's got a Hauser rosette. Sitka spruce top, Indian rosewood back and sides. Um, all I'm really doing is making a new nut and saddle for it, uh, but there is a point that it can illustrate. We're talking about humidification of guitars again. It's February. It's actually a snow day today here, so school was cancelled because uh, of an ice storm. So it's cold and it's dry. I think this guitar has been stored for some time, and if we contemplate the playing surface here, we can see that the fingerboard has assumed something of a concave shape across its length. It's now U-shaped. Classical guitars are of course traditionally made with flat fingerboards, and in this case the top surface here has dried out and is currently much drier it seems than the underside attached to the you know, rigid and dimensionally stable Spanish cedar of the neck. So this top surface has contracted inwards as the moisture left it, and it's taken the frets with it. So these frets are also concave. Also, the ends of the frets have sprouted. They're protruding out from the sides of the board, and if you run your fingers across them, they feel very sharp. So I'm going to carefully dress those off. 
So this looks weird, this U-shaped situation. And it's very tempting to get the sanding beam out and just dress them back to level, make them flat. But we have to be mindful of what could happen when this board rehydrates. Because in the best case scenario, we end up with a flat board with slightly arched frets on it. In the bad scenario, we end up with a very uneven, wavy surface, and we've already dressed off a considerable amount of fret height from these, so there isn't much left to work with, at which point we're pulling them all out and refretting. Here's another point. People wonder how the ends of the frets can sometimes become loose or raised up over the sides of the fretboard. Well, fret wire can have a memory to it. It's slightly bouncy, it's very resilient, um, and when installing it on a flat surface like this, it seems like it's not necessary to bend the wire into a radius like we would on a radius board. But in a case like this, the ends of the frets are now back bowed significantly higher than the center. We hope they stay attached to the board, either through the barbs on the wire or an adhesive in there, because they might not rebound all the way. They've been bent upwards. They could just stay up there, hovering. At which point the task becomes setting them back down again, usually through clamping and gluing. It's a rigmarole. So that's a tip for classical builders. It's a little bit of insurance to over-radius your fret wire when installing it. To pre-bend it slightly, this would be greatly exaggerated, so that when you're installing it, you've pre-loaded it against this situation. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to forcibly rehydrate this board. Weeks in the case with a humidifier is really the way to go, because this has to happen gently. If I just douse the thing with water, yeah, it'll expand, but it's not going to do it under normal conditions. And it might not behave properly. And when you're dealing with frets, you know, tiny, tiny little increments matter, right? So. Uh, I'm going to clean these up, we're going to put it back in the case with a humidifier and see what happens later on. Okay, this has taken longer than usual, but you can see that there is a gap forming between the end of the fingerboard and the binding on this side, and that the heel is just starting to slip up past the edge of the binding. Um, same on this side. You can also see that there is a slight bulge in the top, approaching the edge of the dovetail, um, where the top was actually lifting off the neck block a little bit there. However, I think I can also see the edge of the dovetail there. So that means that there is a space for it to enter, which is a good thing. And that gap is getting wide. I'm going to take out the uh, heat probes now. And I can probably uh, jiggle that free. I'll remove the heat probes. There's enough warmth in and around the pocket there now that it'll stay hot for some time. You see I use the uh, pliers to help assist with the removal. If you're not careful you can kink them or otherwise damage them. Okay. Starting to make some ominous sounds. You don't want to wiggle it too vigorously. You could at this point break the dovetail, which is kind of a sad occasion. Let's apply a little bit more pressure from below every once in a while. Here it comes. You don't get too excited. Slow and steady. And I've, I've mentioned this before, but of the major manufacturers, Gibson dovetails are usually the most difficult to remove. Ironically, if you were going to learn, the best thing would be to get, you know, a 1960s Martin. Because there's often surprises in a Gibson dovetail pocket. Uh, they tend to shim pretty vigorously. And this is very sticky. Okay, notice the cheese pull.
that is uh, aliphatic resin. Probably white glue, I imagine. Tasty. It's a mozzadelle. But, everything considered, pretty clean removal. I can we got some paper shims. Paper? Naughty boy. Um, I'm going to clean out this uh, glue while it's still kind of malleable. Okay, we're going to go back and work on the 1946 SJ here for a bit. We'll remove these truly abominable tuners. Imports from likely the late 60s, early 70s. But they are the grittiest feeling tuners I think I've ever used. Get those out. And the owners decided to go with these um, relic nickel uh, ones from Golden Age from Stuart MacDonald, which should be a pretty close match. Yeah, they'll even use the original screw holes, so that's nice. Yeah, I won't be saving these tuners for spare parts. I will save the screws though. Never have enough little tiny screws on hand. But you can't put those on there, you need an exact replica. From the 1940s. Come on. Look at this guitar. The owner likes those. That's what we're going to use. Authenticity was, you know, abandoned long ago. We'll plug up the old screw holes. I use the miniature flesh cutting saw tear down the plug for the jack. Strangely, a wide chisel seems to be better for this job than a really thin one because this tends to register over a larger surface and keeps you from digging in in little local dips or hollows. Now unfortunately um, these were put on with quite a lot of pressure on the washers, so there is a divot around them, which uh, I have tried to bring up with a little bit of steam, but didn't do very much. Um, so I'm going to have to do some block sanding anyway. There may always be a slight divot there, but again, this entire surface has lots of patina. lightly block sand here with some 220 grit paper. Eventually large portions of this top are going to get sanded this way. Um, obviously the uh, pick guards and the bridge location as well. The trick is to obviously feather out the sanding over a large enough area that you don't see a groove right where the knobs used to be. I don't really want to cut through the lacquer. It might happen though because these divots are quite deep. Okay, that's generally flat, but I can still feel slight indentations around the circumference of each of those, um, which I will likely end up filling with something transparent after I've got some color on these. So I'm going to let these sit. I've uh, wetted them slightly so the fibers would raise and went back and sand them. Now, of course, Doing that, we're aware of the significant color difference. Now this is all going to get oversprayed with an amber tone eventually, of course. But uh, for right now, I'm just going to put a little bit of shellac on these to protect them and uh, provide a base coat for color afterwards. I'm also going to sand the one on the, uh, the jack area as well. So that's all I'm going to do for this week. Um, Next week we're going to get into making some pick guards and a bridge and we'll finish that neck reset and we'll move it along a little bit more. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then.